live from Boston, Massachusetts, it's The Cube, covering Red Hat Summit 2019, brought to you by Red Hat. Welcome back here to the BCEC. We're in Boston, Massachusetts, Red Hat Summit. The sixth time around for us here at The Cube. Proud to be a part of this event once again, along with Stu Miniman. I'm John Walls, and thank you for joining us here on The Cube. We continue our coverage. We're joined by Stormy Peters, who is the Senior Manager and Community Lead at Red Hat. And Stormy, good afternoon to you. How are you good doing? Good afternoon. Glad yeah. to be here. All right, so you think about, you know, I, I love the you know, Community Lead, you know, in, in an open source based uh, company, mm -hmm. you know, like Red Hat, uh, your job is very simple, expand and evolve the ecosystem, right? Yep. So, so I mean, how are you, um, I guess, using that, that company culture, that embedded culture to grow, I think it's already pretty well established what your reputation is for how open you guys are, right, to the community and what have you. What are you doing in terms of leveraging that and trying to expand on that reputation? Yeah, our, our goal is, is to make sure we're supporting those upstream communities. So all of, all of Red Hat software is open source. And we work with a whole community of individuals and companies and the upstream open source software. And we want to make sure that we're not just contributing features that we want, but that we're a good player, that we're helping to make sure those communities are healthy. And so for a number of the projects that we're involved in, we actually assign a full-time community manager, mm -hmm. a community lead, to help make sure that project is healthy. Mm -hmm. So we have someone on everything from Ceph and Glester to Fedora to Kubernetes, um, just making sure the community does well. Mm -hmm. So Stormy, uh, you actually did a session for analysts about a month, a month or so uh -huh. ago, and I've been involved with open source for about 20 years, and you said something that made me do a double take and had to rethink the way I look at this community, and it was, we used to think of open source as, well, maybe I worked on a project, or maybe I spent a little bit of time on nights and weekends, and it was just kind of giving of time. And you said that a majority of people working in this, they've got day jobs that is contribution to this. It's, you know, we, we understand that companies like you know, IBM and Red Hat and Google often will have that, but the majority of people that are contributing to open source now, that is their job or a major part of their job. Could you expand a little bit about you know, how we saw that shift and is it just me that it snuck up on? <laughs> so I, I think it snuck up on us, all of us, but yeah. I really do think it's a fundamental shift that we need to consider so that we can make sure that we're helping the ecosystem the best way possible. So when open source first started, it was people in their free time. Um, you know, Linus Torvalds had a project he wanted to work on. Um, you had an itch to scratch, you wanted your desktop to run free software. And so you put your free time into it, um, evenings and weekends. And if you got a paid job working on it, like that was something to celebrate. Like that's, that was everybody's dream. And these days with software becoming, I don't want to say more complicated, but more complex, um, and the solutions are, are even bigger and greater with the cloud, they're more than a one person project. They're like multi-people, multi-company projects. And so more and more people are getting paid to work on them. And they're getting 40 hours a week, paid time to work on these projects. They might give more, but they're getting a full-time salary. And so how we include not just the individuals, but the companies that are paying them to work on it, I think changes how our projects work. I think it's a huge opportunity. Yep. And, and I mean, talk about that shift a little bit, mm -hmm. if you would, then, and, and how that has, I wouldn't say matured the marketplace, but certainly it's altered the, the, you know, the, the mm -hmm. flows of jobs and, and innovation and development and all that, because all kind of past time before, now full time, and, and what comes with that? I mean, what challenges come with that, where all of a sudden it is a, a little, it, it's, it, it's a little more apparent, if you will. Right, and that you're a little more evident in wherever you're working because it is a full-time commitment now. It's no longer just a, a casual or, or less than full-time pursuit. Yeah, I think it's a good thing, um, but I do think it adds challenges. So, for example, the onboarding process. You used to know when you had an open source software project, you got a, someone was giving up an hour or two of their evening to learn your project, and so you had to make sure the getting started docs worked for them within mm -hmm. 20, 30 minutes maybe. Um, these days, you know, it's really hard to install a lot of this software in 20 or 30 minutes, but someone's doing it as their day job. They're going to have a day or a week, so the onboarding process is different, which I think makes it harder for volunteers and easier for, for paid. Mm -hmm. Volunteers and paid's a little, a little hard to distinguish, but for people that have all day to do it, they have a little more time to get onboarded, so the onboarding processes um, are, are, take longer. Mm -hmm. um, I think the problems that we can solve are more complex, because someone can spend an entire week, they're not breaking their their thought process up 
-hmm. and like evenings they have like all day. Um, they can work with teams across companies so you can pull in lots more expertise. Um, we have special interest groups in projects like CentOS um, where we're pulling in different companies to work together. Um, so like we're working on an NFE SIG with Intel and others. Um, so you get you get more diversity of people that can work on it that can dedicate more brain power to it mm -hmm. in one one setting. Yeah, can, can you talk a little bit about, you've worked on foundations and you support foundations, talked about special interest groups. It's a broad and very diverse ecosystem. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes in the outside world, it's like, oh, it's the, the open source community. And I'm like, no, 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 there is not <laughs> the open source community. There are communities mm -hmm. and lots of overlap and they, they work interact. Maybe give us a little bit of context and love to hear some examples of some of the things you're working on. Yeah, so I, I think the first point is like, projects aren't, their, how they work, their governance isn't, isn't static. Like right. it's always changing. Like you might start a project on your own in your free time and it grew and you convinced all of us to join you and now there's 20 people working on it and you want to be able to go on vacation and you want to leave somebody in charge. So do you give them maintainer status? Do you create a board and let people vote? Um, so do you create a foundation? Like someone offers you money, how do you take it? Like, mm -hmm. do you put it in your bank account or do you have to start a like nonprofit to take this money? Um, so I think they're constantly evolving. Um, so an example that I have is the, the Ceph Foundation. We created the Ceph Foundation um, this year, last year, recently. Um, and Ceph has been open source. It was, it was open source created by Ink Tank, acquired by Red Hat. Um, we created a board of advisors around it to keep all those companies involved. And it had evolved to the point where people wanted to give it money. Um, and so it needed to be something, you know, these companies wanted to collaborate on marketing together. Um, so we created the Ceph Foundation as a, a directed fund into the Linux Foundation and had like 30 companies join in the very beginning. Um, so I think, I don't know what the next stage for Ceph will be, but they're always evolving like that. But so what does it do, if you will, Seth? Um, how do you pick projects? How do, if you have 30 voices, uh -huh. you know, a lot of voices, a lot of people raising their hands uh -huh. saying, let's look at this, let's look at that. You know, how do you govern that? How do you uh, assign work? Um, how does all that work in that kind of, a, that's a really open environment, you know, that right. you're, you're trying to corral a little bit. So, so we're not trying to corral, we're trying to like enable. Or organize, how about yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. Better word, better word. <laughs> so the, the Ceph Foundation was, was to enable people to collaborate on a marketing side mostly, a money side. They wanted to give money for like the Cephalcon event that's happening in a couple of weeks. Um, there's a big annual event. Um, they wanted to be able to do Ceph days. Um, things that you want to give money to to enable. Um, and it was getting really complicated. Well, you pay for the beer and I'll pay for the food and you know, we'll, we'll do it that way. Um, the Ceph project um, technically is led by, it's a group of volunteers who all have paid jobs, um, and there's a project lead per, for each sub-project, and then they have a monthly meeting of all of the, the whole project, and then each of those sub-projects has a weekly meeting. And something that Ceph does that I think is really interesting is they record all of their team meetings, like it's a video meeting, and they record it, and they put it on YouTube, and people watch them. Like, I think that's awesome. <laughs> but it helps them with the time zone problem to record the meeting and put it on YouTube. Yeah. One of the other things that I find really fascinating is, is many enterprise companies now, you know, we know they're using open source, but they're contributing to open source. I remember back the future of open source survey that was done is, I think it was like half of companies that, you know, are using mm -hmm. it are also yeah. contributing. What do you see, you know, we, we've talked to users at this show for many years as to, you know, why they see value and why they do it, but I would lo love to hear your take. So I, I do think companies are, they're using open source software, but they're contributing. Um, and, and people talk about, well, you contribute the features that you want to see, but I, I think you contribute to the things you find exciting and that you want to participate in. Um, and contribution starts at like the very beginning level of, of just filing a bug report when you see it or coming to an event and going to the happy hour for, the, for that project. Um, Seth and Gluster have one this afternoon, this afternoon. <laughs> um, you know, there's different get-togethers, and you participate by meeting the people, telling them how you're using it, um, telling them what you'd like to see, what's cool. Um, I, I think a lot of people, in the open source world, there's an opportunity for the developers to be very close to the users in a way that's harder in proprietary software, mm -hmm. and it, it's really exciting. Like, if you're working on something and someone comes up and says, hey, I'm using it, and here's what I like, it's, you know, it's, it's fun. Yeah. It's working. Yeah. 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 So, All right. well, how about career advancement? You know, everybody I know in the developer mm -hmm. world, it's like, well, Git really is your resume these days. So mm -hmm. got to imagine that just the, the, the skill set and the education is such a huge part for so many companies. Yeah, and with more people getting paid to work on open source and they can show what they've worked on, um, that 
it's it's more not more common. It's very easy to move to another job, taking your skill set with you, and it's very valued. And you even get to keep your community of people that you're working with um, as you move around and help different companies with that project. How do you divvy it up in a community where, you know, the, the workload is kind of equally shared, or there's a fair share of work being done, and you and you want to maybe some people have a different level of expertise, mm -hmm. and so there's some policing that kind of has to be done, or or I guess some responsibilities assigned or whatever, that could be a little delicate sometimes, can it? That you, know, you, you want to get the right people doing the right things and you, you love willingness and enthusiasm, but sometimes you do have to kind of decide, are right, you going to work on this, we're going to work on that. So some projects have done a really excellent job of defining the roles and assigning them and having like a mentoring process to get new people there. Um, so for example, Kubernetes on the release team, there's like people that work on the release team and then if you're interested, you raise your hand and you like work with the, the person that's in that role for like an entire release. And so you get like a whole release to be mentored and taught. And then the next year, you're the person doing the release and you can mentor somebody else. Um, so I think the processes help with that and it's, I think there's some really great work so being done. So you're building the farm team basically, right? You're bringing them along on training wheels to a certain degree, uh -huh. and then let them ride the bike by themselves. Yep. Makes right. sense. So speaking of getting people ready, uh, there, there was something new announced this week that, that I'm hoping you can explain. It's the Red Hat Universal base image. It was explained to me that this is really a subset of RHEL or being RHEL ready. What does that mean? How's that going to impact developers? Yeah, the idea is to help developers develop in containers on Linux and in a way that they can, so the UBI is based on RHEL. Um, it's a subset of RHEL packages. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a container, so it's in the, in the cloud space. And uh, you can develop your app on it and then you can share that container with anybody whether or not they're a RHEL user. Um, so you can share it with anybody in the world to have them develop on it. But then when you're done, um, it, it is supported on RHEL and OpenShift. Um, so you can have full enterprise support for it. How does a show like this inject um, you know, new blood, new perspective into what you do? Because I would assume this is a pretty good recruiting opportunity too, <laughs> in a lot of respects, and you stay pretty busy over the course of these three days, meeting with a lot of new people, meeting a lot of new faces, getting a lot of new ideas. I mean, how does this show kind of fit into what you're going to do the other 362 days of the year? Well, we look forward to this show for 364 days a year, so we're always planning for it and prepping for it. Um, it's, it, it adds energy, it adds excitement. We get to connect with people that are using the software. Hopefully they do come to the happy hours or down to the booth and talk to us and say, here's how we're using it. And um, we hope to get more people involved, people that are, are using software that want to learn about it, get them more involved. Well, you've done a great job of pulling the community together. Mm -hmm. uh, we wish you continued success in doing that. And thanks for the time today here on theCUBE. Nice to have you. Great. Thank you very much for having me. You bet. Stormy thanks. Peters joining us from Red Hat. Back with more in just a little bit. You're watching the Red Hat Summit and you're watching exclusive coverage right here on theCUBE.